I confess that um, I hadn't really known uh, that there was such a thing as critical governance studies, and uh, nor exactly what it is. But I can tell you from the two sessions I've attended so far, I feel um, that whatever it is, I'm, it, it's a kindred spirit to me. Uh, the, the discussions that I've been in so far have been incredibly interesting. I've learned a great deal, so I can only hope that what I have to say will uh, seem relevant to you. Now, I want to start uh, with some reflections, though, about uh, critical theory in the present moment. Uh, I want to suggest that, um, by all rights, the current crisis of neoliberal capitalism should alter the landscape of critical theorizing. It's my view that during the last two decades, many critical theorists have kept their distance from the sort of large-scale social theorizing associated with Marxism. Apparently accepting the necessity of academic specialization, they have settled on one or another branch of disciplinary inquiry conceived as a freestanding enterprise. So whether the focus was jurisprudence or moral philosophy, democratic theory or cultural criticism, international relations theory, or perhaps governmentality studies. The work has proceeded in relative disconnection from fundamental questions of social theory. The critique of capitalist society, and I don't just mean the economic critique, but the social critique of capitalist society, pivotal for earlier generations, has all but vanished from the agenda of critical theory. Critique centered on capitalist crisis especially was pronounced reductive, deterministic, and de passe. Well, today, such verities lie in tatters. With the global financial system still teetering, worldwide production and employment still in free fall, and the looming prospect of a prolonged recession, the economic aspect of capitalist crisis is impossible to ignore. But the same is true of the ecological aspect, given global warming, worsening pollution, resource exhaustion, and new forms of biocommodification that penetrate nature's very core. Then, too, the social dimension of crisis is increasingly salient. Witness the devastated neighborhoods, <coughs> displaced families, and war and disease ravaged communities that crisscross our so called planet of slums, to use Mike Davis's phrase. Nor can one overlook the political dimension the crisis, first, of the modern territorial state, second, of the latter's would be regional successors, above all the European Union, third, of US hegemony and fourth of the institutions of global governance, such as they are, all of which lack the imagination to envision solutions and the will and capacity to implement them. And then finally, one should mention the crisis of critique itself and the crisis of emancipation, as neither critical theorists nor emancipatory social movements have so far managed to rise to the occasion. A crisis of this sort which I want to insist is multidimensional, not simply an economic and financial crisis, supplies the inescapable backdrop, in my view, for every serious attempt at critical theorizing. Henceforth, such theorizing can no longer avoid the question of capitalist society. Large-scale social theorizing, aimed at clarifying the nature and roots of crisis, as well as the prospects for an emancipatory resolution should again regain its central place in critical theorizing. Yet how exactly should critical theorists approach these matters? How to overcome the deficits of discredited economistic approaches, which focus exclusively on the so-called system logic of the capitalist economy? How to develop an expanded non-economistic understanding of capitalist society? which incorporates the insights of feminism, post-colonialism, ecological thinking, and now I learn critical governance studies. How to
to conceptualize crisis above all as a social process in which economics is mediated by history, <coughs> culture, and geography, by politics, ecology, and law. How to comprehend the full range of social struggles in the current conjuncture, and how to assess the prospect, the potential for emancipatory social transformation. Well, I want to suggest, as the subtitle of this lecture already uh, tells you, that the thought of Karl Polanyi affords a promising starting point for such theorizing. His 1944 classic, The Great Transformation, elaborates an account of capitalist crisis as a multifaceted historical process that began with the Industrial Revolution in Britain and proceeded over the course of more than a century to envelop the entire world in training imperial subjection, periodic depressions, and cataclysmic wars. For Polanyi, moreover, the capitalist crisis was less about economic breakdown in the narrow sense than about disintegrated communities, ruptured solidarities, and despoiled nature. Its roots lay less in intra-economic contradictions, such as the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, than in a momentous shift in the place of economy vis-a-vis -vis society. Overturning what had been the universal relation <coughs> um, in which markets were embedded in social institutions and subject to moral and ethical norms, proponents of the so-called self-regulating market sought to build a world in which society, morals, and ethics were subordinated to, indeed modeled on, markets. That aspiration, inherently self-undermining and unrealizable, drove developments so deeply destructive of human society as to spark an ongoing counter-movement for the latter's protection. It was this double movement, as Polanyi called it, the drive to expand and autonomize markets, followed by demands for social protection that led ultimately, in his view, to fascism and world war. So here is an account of capitalist crisis that transcends the cramped confines of economistic thinking. Masterful, capacious, and encompassing action at multiple scales, the Great Transformation weaves together local protest, national politics, international affairs, and global financial governance in a powerful historical synthesis. Like Marx, Polanyi emphasized social struggle. But in place of the conflict between labor and capital, he foregrounded that between forces favoring marketization and cross-class movements for social protection. Like Marx, too, Polanyi sought to influence history, but his attitude to markets was different. Written with the aim of shaping the post-war order, the Great Transformation constituted a brief for a new international regime of democratic governance that would defang markets, removing their sting without suppressing them altogether. <clears throat> now, I think that these points alone would qualify Polanyi as a promising resource for those of us who seek to understand the travails of 21st century capitalist society. But there are other more specific reasons for turning to him today. The story told in The Great Transformation has strong echoes in current developments. Certainly there is at least a prima facie case for the view that the present crisis has its roots in recent efforts to disencumber markets from the governance regimes both national and international, that were established in the aftermath of World War II. What we today call neoliberalism is nothing but the second coming of the very same 19th century faith in the so-called self-regulating market that unleashed the capitalist crisis Polanyi chronicled. Now, as then, attempts to implement that creed are rending social bonds, destroying livelihoods, and despoiling nature. Now, as then, counter forces are mobilizing to protect society and nature from the ravages of the market. And so, on its face at least, today's crisis is plausibly viewed as a second great transformation, a great transformation redux. For many reasons, then, 
I think that Polanyi's perspective holds considerable promise for theorizing today. Yet, one should not rush to embrace it uncritically. Even as it overcomes economism, the great transformation turns out on closer inspection to be deeply flawed. Focused single-mindedly on harms emanating from disembedded markets, the book overlooks harms originating elsewhere in the surrounding society, as he calls it. Occulting non-market-based forms of injustice, it also tends to whitewash forms of social protection that are at the same time vehicles of domination. Focused overwhelmingly on struggles against market-based depredations, the book neglects struggles against injustices rooted in society and encoded in social protections. So I'm suggesting that critical theorists should not embrace Polanyi's framework in the form in which it appears in The Great Transformation. What's needed, rather, is a revision of this framework. The goal, I suggest, should be a new quasi-Polanyian conception of capitalist crisis that not only avoids reductive economism, but also avoids romanticizing quote-unquote society. And that, indeed, is my aim in the present lecture. Seeking to develop a critique that comprehends society as well as economy, I propose to broaden Polanyi's problematic to encompass a third project that cross-cuts his central conflict between marketization and social protection. This third project, which I shall call emancipation, aims to overcome forms of subjection rooted in society as well as in economy. Central to both iterations of the Great Transformation, the one analyzed by Polanyi and the one we are living through now, struggles for emancipation constitute the missing third that mediates every conflict between marketization and social protection. The effect of introducing this missing third will be to transform Polanyi's double movement into what I shall call a triple movement, embracing marketization, social protection, and emancipation. The triple movement is designed to map the collision of those three political projects, each of which remains salient today. So this figure of a triple movement will form the core of a new quasi polanyian perspective that can clarify capitalist crisis and the crisis of governance in the 21st century. So I'm going to begin by recalling some of Polanyi's concepts, which I think most of you know quite well, uh, especially the concepts of the disembedded market and fictitious commodities. Famously, Polanyi distinguished two different relations in which markets can stand to society. On the one hand, they can be embedded, that is, enmeshed in non-economic institutions and subject to non-economic norms, such as in the pre-capitalist world, the just price and the fair wage. On the other hand, markets can be disembedded, freed from extra economic controls, and governed imminently by supply and demand. Now, the first possibility, claims Polanyi, represents the historical norm. Throughout most of history, in otherwise disparate civilizations and in widely separated locales, markets have been subject to non-economic controls, which limit what can be bought and sold, by whom, and on what terms. The second possibility, in contrast, is historically <coughs> anomalous. A 19th century British invention, the so-called self-regulating market, was an utterly <coughs> novel idea whose deployment, Polanyi contends, threatens the very fabric of human society. Now, let me immediately qualify that for Polanyi, markets can in fact never be fully disembedded from the larger society. The attempt to make them so must inexorably fail. For one thing, markets can function properly only against a non-economic background of cultural understandings and solidarity relations. Attempts to disembed them destroy that background. For another, the attempt to establish self-regulating markets proves so destructive of the fabric of society as to provoke widespread demands for their social regulation. So far from enhancing cooperation, the project of disembedding markets inevitably triggers 
social crisis and political resistance. In the end, therefore, Polanyi's distinction is better grasped as a difference in degree than as a difference in kind. While markets can never be fully disembedded, they can be more or less embedded. But even more important, as we shall see, they can be embedded in different ways. The Great Transformation recounts the process by which British commercial interests sought to engineer this impossible creature, the so-called self-regulating market. In the process, they had to disable the non-economic trappings in which markets had been embedded. Especially <coughs> crucial was removal of restrictions on the buying and selling of land, labor, and money, previously limited by customary rights and community mores, by moral and religious norms, by structures of family and kin, by local authorities and the mercantilist policies of national states. When the new commercially dominated government of the 1830s and 40s dismantled the system of outdoor relief and the tariffs and subsidies on corn, it effectively denuded land, labor, and money of their protective covering and transformed them into what Polanyi called fictitious commodities. Abandoned to the law of supply and demand, these fundamental bases of human society could now be bought and sold without regard for the consequences. According to Polanyi, however, the fictitious commodification of land, labor, and money triggered crisis. For him, as for Marx, these three elements are foundational for every social form of material provisioning. No economy is conceivable except on the basis of nature, of human labor and energy, and on the basis of some medium of exchange. But to treat these necessary premises of social life as mere commodities tradable at will, like any widget, is to essentially confuse fundaments with the surface phenomena they render possible. The effect is to jeopardize these social preconditions for markets, hence to jeopardize markets, and more fundamentally, to jeopardize society <coughs> as such. Now, what I've just described could be thought of as a system theoretic notion of crisis. That is, a notion that foregrounds the inherently self-contradictory character of capitalism's social logic, system logic, I should say. But Polanyi joins this system theoretical idea of capitalist crisis to an action theoretic conception, which is centered on the responses of social actors. So in his view, society, as he calls it, did not endure the effects of market disembedding and fictitious commodification with equanimity. From the beginning, rural landowners, urban workers, and other strata mobilized to protect endangered livelihoods, communities, and habitats. Despite their differences, Tories, socialists, cooperative movements, trade unionists, religious activists, environmentalists, and opponents of international free trade effectively constituted a broad cross-class party of social protection. Aiming to protect labor, they sought to limit its commodification through legislation regulating wages and hours. <coughs> Aiming to protect the agricultural lifeblood of rural communities, they sought tariffs on imported foodstuffs. Aiming to protect livelihoods, they sought to rein in financial speculation and to limit international free trade. In parts progressive, in parts reactionary, the forces of social protection opposed those of marketization. Defending society against economy, they turned where else to politics to try to reinvent markets. Like their antagonists, they too mobilized in civil society and sought to capture state power. And so it was this sharpening struggle between these two camps the marketizers and the protectionists, neither able definitively to defeat the other, that lent the distinctive shape of a so-called double movement to a century and a half of ongoing capitalist crisis. Now, it is true, of course, that Polanyi's account depends chiefly on English developments. But he understood the double movement as a general schema with broad application. 
And that assumption I think is plausible, I think, given British hegemony, which proved so consequential for developments elsewhere, for the colonies, for the rival European powers, and for the international regimes that structured their interactions. By the 20th century, moreover, the free marketeers had established an international regime of free trade based on the gold standard that effectively universalized capitalist crisis. In the context of global economic depression, iterations of the double <coughs> movement appeared throughout the world as counterforces of varied ideological stripes from New Dealers to communists to fascists sought social protection in various forms, democratic, totalitarian, racist, eventually engulfing the planet in war. The resolution in Polanyi's view had to be international, anticipating a new global international regime. He advocated a governance framework that would foster market regulation and social provision by democratic welfare states. The goal for him then was to return the economy to its proper place in society, which of course was not the same as returning to mercantilism. So in general, these concepts, fictitious commodification and disembedded markets are absolutely central to this expanded notion of capitalist crisis. And on its face, they have much to offer to critical theorizing. As I've already noted, they point beyond economism to an expansive understanding of capitalist crisis as a multifaceted historical process as much social, political, and, eco and ecological as economic. <coughs> Thematizing the commodification of nature, which I think is amazingly prescient, Polanyi integrated, or at least he gave us, the capacity to integrate the ecological dimension while also recognizing social disruption and political stalemate as constitutive aspects of capitalist crisis. In addition, his approach points beyond a kind of functionalist systems logic. Centering his account on the double movement, he gave pride of place to the projects of social actors and to the collisions among them. In this way, he effectively jettisoned the orthodox systems theoretic view of capitalist crisis as this one-dimensional systems view as a kind of objective system breakdown and conceived it also in action theoretic terms as an intersubjective political process. Then too, one could say that Polanyi's categories make possible a crisis critique that does not reject markets as such but only the dangerous disembedded variety. And so his concept of an embedded market affords the prospect of a progressive alternative, both to the wanton disembedding promoted by neoliberals and to the wholesale suppression of markets traditionally favored by communists. Nevertheless, now I come to the butt, Polanyi's handling of these categories is <coughs> deeply problematic. As he portrays them, Embedded markets are associated with social protection, which is figured as shelter from the harsh elements. Disembedded markets are associated with exposure, with being left to swim naked in the icy water of egotistical calculation, to use Marx and Engels' phrase. These inflections, embedded markets are good, disembedded markets bad, carry over to the double movement. The marketizing pole signifies danger, while the protectionist poll connotes safe haven. This evaluative subtext is problematic. On the one hand, <coughs> Polanyi's account of embedded markets and social protections is far too rosy. Romanticizing society, as he calls it, it occults the fact that the communities in which markets have historically been embedded have also been the locus of oppression. Conversely, Polanyi's account of disembedding is a bit too dark. Having idealized society, it occludes the fact that whatever their other effects, processes that disembed markets from oppressive protections contain at least a kernel of emancipation. Now, I want to be clear, just to avoid any misunderstanding, of course, Polanyi never intended to idealize traditional society, let alone to endorse oppression. An independent socialist, 
he advocated re-embedding markets in egalitarian democratic regimes precisely in order to forestall the return of authoritarian and fascist alternatives. So he realized clearly that not all regimes of protection were morally equivalent. But Polanyi never translated those important moral intuitions into theoretical terms. He failed to provide the conceptual resources needed to distinguish between better and worse ways of embedding markets. Present day critical theorists then must revise his framework, avoiding both wholesale condemnation of disembedding and wholesale approbation of re-embedding. We must open both prongs of the double movement to critical scrutiny exposing the normative <coughs> deficits of society as well as those of economy, we must validate struggles against oppression wherever it roots. Now, to this end, I propose to draw on a resource not utilized by Polanyi, namely the insights of emancipatory social movements. Unmasking power asymmetries occluded by him, such movements exposed the predatory underside of the embedded markets he tended to idealize. Protesting protections that were also oppressions, they raised claims for emancipation. Exploiting their insights and drawing on the benefit of hindsight to be sure, I want to rethink the idea of a double movement in relation to struggles for emancipation. Now to speak of emancipation is to introduce a category that does not appear in the great transformation. But the idea, and indeed the word, figured importantly throughout the period Polanyi chronicled. One need only mention epical struggles to abolish slavery, liberate women, and free non-European peoples from colonial subjection, all of which were waged in the name of emancipation. Now, it is perhaps odd that these struggles should be absent from a work purporting to chart the rise and fall of what it calls 19th century civilization. But my point is not simply to flag an omission. It's rather to note that struggles for emancipation directly challenged oppressive forms of social protection while neither wholly condemning nor simply celebrating marketization. Had they been included, these movements would have destabilized the dualistic narrative schema of the great transformation. To see why, Consider that emancipation differs importantly from Polanyi's chief positive category, <coughs> namely social protection. Whereas protection is opposed to exposure, emancipation is opposed to domination. While protection aims to shield society from the disintegrative effects of unregulated markets, emancipation aims to expose oppressive relations wherever they root in society as well as in economy. Whereas the thrust of protection is to subject market exchange to non-economic norms, that of emancipation is to subject both market exchange and non-market norms to critical scrutiny. Thus, whereas protection's highest values are social security, social stability, social solidarity, emancipation's priority is non-domination. And these values can pull in opposite directions. It would be wrong, however, to conclude that emancipation is always allied with marketization. If emancipation opposes oppression, marketization opposes the extra economic regulation of production and exchange, whether such regulation is meant to protect or to liberate. While marketization defends the supposed autonomy of the economy, understood formally as a demarcated sphere of instrumental action, Emancipation ranges across the boundaries that demarcate spheres, speaking, seeking to root out oppression or domination from every sphere. Thus, while the thrust of marketization is to liberate buying and selling from ethical and moral norms, that of emancipation is to scrutinize all types of norms from the standpoint of justice. Therefore, whereas marketization claims efficiency, individual choice, and the negative liberty of non-interference as its highest values, emancipation's priority, as I just said, 
is non-domination. It follows that struggles for emancipation do not map neatly onto either prong of Polanyi's double movement. Granted, such struggles appear on occasion to converge with marketization, as, for example, when they condemn as oppressive the very social protections that free marketeers are seeking to eradicate. On other occasions, however, they converge with protectionist projects, as, for example, when they denounce the oppressive effects of deregulation. On still other occasions, finally, struggles for emancipation diverge from both prongs of the double movement, as, for example, when they aim neither to dismantle nor to defend existing <coughs> protections, but perhaps to transform the mode of protection. So convergences where they exist are conjunctural and contingent, aligned consistently neither with protection nor deregulation. Such struggles for emancipation represent a third force that disrupts Polanyi's schema. To give such struggles their due requires us to revise his framework by transforming its double movement into a triple movement. Now I want to consider just two of the many, many social movements that have mobilized under the banner of emancipation, namely feminism and anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism. Each of these two currents of emancipatory struggle have disclosed a specific way in which social protection can be oppressive. Feminists have unmasked the oppressive character of protections premised on status hierarchies, showing that what they protected was less society, per se, than hierarchy. Likewise, anti-imperialists and anti-colonialists have unmasked the injustice of first world social protections that were financed off the backs of ex-colonial peoples whom they excluded. In other words, they showed the injustice of what I would call misframed protections in which the scale of exposure to danger, which is often transnational, was not matched by the scale at which protection was organized, which was typically national. Now, in each case, the movement Called, attention, called, called into question an aspect of what Hegel would have called the ethical substance or zitlischkeit that informs social protection. Necessarily, protections institutionalize normative understandings, not only of danger and safety, but also of family, community, and belonging, of personhood, dignity, and desert, of dependency, contribution, and work, hence of gender, nationality, and race. Having subjected such understandings to critical scrutiny, feminists and anti-imperialists have effectively posed for us a number of crucial questions that Polanyi overlooked. Do the institutionalized meanings and norms that define who is protected from what and how entrench relations of domination? Is the ethical substance that informs protection hierarchical or egalitarian, difference friendly or difference hostile? Is the mode of protection bureaucratic and etatist or participatory and democratic? Is protection misframed or well-framed? I want to look a little bit more closely at these two critiques. And drawing first on feminism, consider that social and political arrangements that embed markets can be oppressive in virtue of being hierarchical. In such cases, they entrench status differentials that deny some who are included in principle as members of society the social conditions for full participation. The classic example, certainly for feminists, is gender hierarchy, which assigns women a lesser status, often akin to that of a male child, and thereby prevents them from participating fully on a par with men in social interaction. But of course, one could also cite caste hierarchies, including those premised on racialist ideologies. In all such cases, 
social protections work to the advantage of those at the top of the status hierarchy, affording lesser, if any, benefit to those at the bottom. What they protect accordingly is less society per se than social hierarchy. No wonder then that feminist, anti-racist, and anti-caste movements of various stripes have mobilized against such hierarchies, rejecting the protections they purport to offer, insisting on full participation in society. They have sought to dismantle arrangements that entrench domination. I mean, I think it's very telling that Polanyi could use this term protection with such innocence. To any feminist, the bells ring as soon as you hear that word. And I, I don't say that as a put down of him, but it does say something about um, the, uh, let's say, the, the feminism at, in that period in which he was writing, let's say, being a bit low on the radar screen for many people, certainly. <laughs> Okay, um, now the feminist critique of hierarchical protection runs through every stage of Polanyi's history, although it is never mentioned by him. During the mercantilist era, feminists like Mary Wollstonecraft criticized the traditional social arrangements that embedded markets, condemning the gender hierarchies entrenched in family, religion, law, and social custom. They demanded such fundamental prerequisites of non-domination as an independent legal personality, religious freedom, education, the right to refuse sex, rights of custody in their children, and the right to speak in public and to vote. During the period of laissez-faire, feminists demanded equal access to the market. Exposing the latter's instrumentalization of sexist norms, they opposed protections that denied them the right to own property, sign contracts, control wages, practice professions, work the same hours, and receive the same pay as men, all prerequisites of non-domination. During the post-World War II era of so-called embedded liberalism, second wave feminists targeted what was called the public patriarchy instituted by welfare states. Condemning social protections premised on the family wage, they demanded equal pay for work of comparable worth, parity for caregiving and wage earning and social entitlements, and an end to the gender division of labor, both paid and unpaid. So in each of these epochs, feminists raise claims for emancipation aimed at dismantling hierarchical protections. At some moments, they targeted traditional community structures that embedded markets. At others, they aimed their fire at the forces that were disembedding markets. At still others, their principal foes were those who were re-embedding markets. And so feminist claims did not align consistently with either pole of Polanyi's double movement. On the contrary, their struggles for emancipation constituted a third prong of social movement, which cut across the other two. Now let's look briefly at the other case I want to consider. The social and political arrangements that embed markets can also be oppressive in a second way, in virtue of being misframed. Misframing is a neologism I have coined for mismatches of scale. In this case, between the scale at which markets are embedded, which as I say is usually national, and that at which they expose people to danger, which is often transnational. The oppression of misframing arises when protective arrangements externalize the negative effects of markets onto outsiders, wrongly excluding some of those exposed, while saddling them with the costs of protecting others. Obvious examples are colonialism and its neo-imperial successor regimes. Historically, the arrangements that protected nascent European industries had as their flip side the colonial subjugation of non-Europeans. Even today, social welfare provision in Europe and North America, such as it is, is largely financed by economic domination of the global south by means of debt and unequal exchange. In both cases, the arrangements that embed markets serve the citizens of the metropolitan powers at the expense of peripheral subjects. The latter's exploitation subsidizes the former's protection. Now, misframing differs from hierarchy as a mode of domination. Whereas the latter denies parity to internal subordinates, the former constitutes as external others some whose labor is essential to society, 
for example, colonial subjects, undocumented <coughs> workers, and other non-citizens. Thus, while hierarchical protections deny full membership to some who are recognized as belonging to society, misframed protections deny the status of membership to some on whose activities society relies. Now, Polanyi himself laid the basis for the critique of misframed protections, although he did not articulate it explicitly. In The Great Transformation, he observed first, that political states are necessary prerequisites for, so, for successful social protection, and second, that they are unevenly available in the modern world. And so he writes, and I quote, if the organized states of Europe could protect themselves against the backwash of international free trade, the politically unorganized colonial peoples could not. The protection which the white man could easily secure for himself through the sovereign status of his communities was out of reach of the colored man as long as he lacked the prerequisite political government. Now, what exactly had caused the colored man's lack? At the height of what they called laissez-faire, European powers used their colonies both as dedicated sources of raw materials and cheap foodstuffs and also as protected outlets for their manufactured goods. So colonialism served precisely to protect <coughs> European industry and to cushion European peoples from the harshest effects of unregulated capitalism, while at the same time depriving colonized peoples of the means of protection. It seemed to follow that colonized <coughs> peoples would gain protection by achieving independence and acquiring states of their own. But of course, even after decolonization, that goal proved elusive. The reason has to do with another Polanyian insight. The regulatory capacities of states, and I should say the protective capacities of states, depend importantly on international arrangements. Observing that the gold standard free trade regime of the early 20th century had prevented European states from adopting protective policies like full employment or deficit spending, policies that depend on control of the money supply, Polanyi concluded that the post-World War II international regime should be designed in such a way as to permit, indeed, to facilitate protective policies at the national level. What he did not anticipate, however, was that the embedded liberalism established after the war would serve some states far better than others. In that period, when imperialism assumed the <coughs> so-called non-political form of unequal exchange between newly independent ex-colonies and their erstwhile masters, the latter continued to finance their domestic welfare systems on the backs of the former. The disparity has been exacerbated in the neoliberal era, moreover, by policies like structural adjustment as international agencies like the IMF have used the weapon of debt to further undercut the protective capacities of post-colonial states, compelling them to divest their assets, open their markets, and slash social spending. I guess we should count Ireland as a post-colonial state. Historically, therefore, international arrangements have entrenched disparities in the capacities of states to protect their populations from the vagaries of international markets. They have permitted the domestic re-embedding of markets by the states of the core, but not by those of the periphery. No wonder, then, that anti-colonial and anti-imperialist movements have mobilized against misframed protections. In each historical era, they have raised claims for emancipation, which, again, cannot be fitted into Polanyi's schema. Prior to independence, they sought national liberation, whether by negotiated transition or armed insurrection. After independence, they challenged the governance structures of the global economy, such as in our time, the WTO and the IMF. At some moments, anti-imperialists have protested the forcible disembedding of their own local markets from their own pre-colonial societies. At others, they have opposed the re-embedding of European markets at their expense. Like the claims of feminists, then, the claims of anti-imperialists have not aligned consistently with either prong of Polanyi's double movement. In their case, too, struggles for emancipation constituted a distinct third force. 
Here, too, what Polanyi called a double movement is better grasped as what I would like to call a triple movement, encompassing marketization, social protection, and emancipation. Now, what these cases show, I think, is that neither the great transformation described by Polanyi nor the one we are living through now can be adequately understood by the figure of the double movement. In reducing the action theoretic logic of crisis to a two-sided conflict between marketization and social protection, that figure not only occults projects of emancipation, but also distorts our understanding of the two projects it purports to clarify. In fact, neither marketization nor social protection can be adequately understood without factoring in struggles for emancipation. And I want to conclude by spelling out what I think is to be gained by looking at matters through this lens. The idea of a triple movement conceptualizes capitalist crisis, or at least its action logic, as a three-sided conflict among marketization, social protection, and emancipation. In our time, each of these three orientations has committed adherence. Marketization is championed, of course, by neoliberals, enough said. Social protection commands support in various forms, some savory, some quite unsavory, from nationally oriented social democrats and trade unionists to anti-immigrant populist movements, from neo-traditional religious movements to anti-globalization activists, from environmentalists to <coughs> indigenous peoples. Emancipation fires the passions of various successors or continuations of the social movements I've discussed, as well as others, including multiculturalists, international feminists, gay and lesbian liberationists, cosmopolitan Democrats, human rights activists, and proponents of global justice. So I'm suggesting it's the complex relations among <laughs> these three types of projects that is impressing the shape of a triple movement on the present crisis of capitalist society. I'm also suggesting that to clarify this constellation, we should think of each term of this triple movement as ambivalent. I've already suggested, contra Polanyi, that social protection is often ambivalent, affording res relief from the disintegrative effects of deregulation on the one hand, while simultaneously entrenching domination on the other. But the same is true, I want now to suggest, of the other two terms. Deregulation of markets does indeed have the negative effects Polanyi stressed, but it can also beget some positive effects to the extent that the protections it disintegrates are oppressive. As, for example, when markets are introduced into bureaucratically administered command economies, or when labor markets are opened to former slaves or to women who have been protected out of them. Nor, and this is maybe the most controversial point, nor is emancipation immune to ambivalence as it produces not only liberation, but also strains in the fabric of solidarity. Even as it overcomes domination, emancipation may help dissolve the solidary ethical basis of social protection, thereby inadvertently fostering further marketization. So seen this way, each term has both a telos of its own and the potential for ambivalence that unfolds through its interaction with the other two terms. None of the three can be adequately grasped in isolation from the others, nor can the social field be adequately grasped by focusing on only <coughs> two terms. It is only when all three are considered together that we begin to get an adequate view of the action theoretical side of contemporary crisis. So here then is the core premise of my argument concerning this triple movement. The relation between any two sides of the three-sided conflict must be mediated by the third. So, as I have been arguing here, the conflict between marketization and social protection must be mediated by emancipation. <coughs> Equally, however, conflicts between protection and emancipation must be mediated by marketization. And so the critique I've been making of Polanyi can also be turned in another direction against the adherence of emancipation. 
if he neglected the impact of struggles for emancipation on conflicts between marketization and social protection, then they, or perhaps I should say we, include myself, have neglected the impact of marketizing projects on conflicts between social protection and emancipation. As I noted, feminists and anti-imperialists have forcefully challenged oppressive protections in the post-war era. In each case, the movements, the struggles have disclosed a type of domination and raised a corresponding claim for emancipation. In each case too, however, the claims for emancipation were ambivalent. They could line up in principle either with marketization or with social protection. In the first case, where emancipation aligned with marketization, it would serve to erode not just the oppressive dimension, but the solidary basis of social protection simplicity term. In the second case, where emancipation aligned with social protection, it would serve not to erode, but to transform the ethical substance undergirding social protection. As a matter of fact, I believe that both movements have encompassed both those orientations. In each case, liberal currents gravitated in the direction of marketization, while socialist and social democratic currents were more likely to align with forces for social protection. I've made this argument in some detail with respect to feminism in the New Left Review um, article that Jonathan mentioned. Arguably, however, emancipation's ambivalence has been resolved in recent years in favor of marketization. Insufficiently attuned to the rise of neoliberalism, the hegemonic currents of emancipatory struggle have formed what Hester Eisenstein has called a dangerous liaison with marketization. In the view of some observers, namely Boltonsky and Chapello, they have supplied the new spirit or charismatic rationale for a new mode of capital accumulation, flexible post fordist transnational. At the very least, the emancipatory <coughs> critique of oppressive protection has converged with a neoliberal critique of protection per se. In the conflict zone of a triple movement, if I can use a, an American basketball metaphor, I don't know if it will fly here, emancipation has joined forces with marketization to double team social protection. Now, the point suggests a way of rewriting, and this is my conclusion, Polanyi's project for the 21st century. By theorizing the double movement, he portrayed the conflicts of his time as an epical battle for the soul of the market. Will nature, labor, and money be stripped of all ethical meaning, sliced, diced, and traded like widgets into hell with the consequences? Or will markets in those fundamental bases of human society be subject to ethically and morally informed political regulation? That battle remains as pressing as ever in the 21st century. But the triple movement <coughs> casts it in a sharper light, as cross-cut by two other major battles of apical significance. One is a battle for the soul of social protection. Will the arrangements that re-embed markets in the post-neoliberal era, the era we anticipate as arriving at some point, be hierarchical or egalitarian, misframed or well-framed, difference-hostile or difference-friendly, bureaucratic or participatory? The other cross-cutting apical battle is for the soul of emancipation. Will the emancipatory struggles of the 21st century serve to advance the further disembedding and deregulation of markets? Or will they serve to democratize social protections, to extend them, and to make them more just? These questions suggest a project for those of us who remain committed to emancipation. We might resolve to break off our dangerous liaison with marketization and try to form a principled new alliance with social protection and thereby realigning the poles of the triple movement, we could integrate our long-standing interest in non-domination with legitimate interest in solidarity, social security, and even social stability, without, of course, neglecting the importance of negative liberty. Embracing a broader understanding of social justice, such a project would serve at once 
to honor Polanyi's insights and to remedy his blind spots. Thank you very much.